Well, you should know that the, the godly life, the spiritual life, um, the truly following Jesus, if you like, in terms of Western understanding, is, is not a healing ministry. You know, it's not getting answers to prayers. It's not worship. It's just loving God as your dad, heavenly dad. It's not church, it's not religion, not even Bible study. It's living with this awareness, consciousness of your Heavenly Father with you always. And you ascribe a character to him that is your um, your whole value system, what you truly value. And, and you find in the living of this that some of your value system doesn't quite add up, doesn't bring in the goods, if you like, doesn't. Something's wrong at times, and you think, Oh, have I misunderstood something? My goodness, that's not consistent with that, is it? You know, I mean, the person who suddenly realises that I do love animals and I eat meat. This is not entirely consistent, is it? <laughs> Put it mildly. Should I be eating my friends? <laughs> hmm. Perhaps I'd better rethink this. Perhaps there's a way of eating that is at least survivable enough to not hurt my friends. And so you seek, well, is, is a vegetarian diet going to do? My mum was convinced it wouldn't. You'd end up with a pretty disastrous personality like George Bernard Shaw from her point of view. And um, uh, I was of the opinion, well, mm, but it's more important to me the welfare of these animals. Um, and perhaps I can, or, or perhaps she's not right even, but it's important for me enough to try and see. So of course I just gave up meat to begin with. Uh, and I thought, well, there's not much difference between killing an animal or killing a fish. I mean, it doesn't, I don't want to hurt. It looks like hurting to me, although uh, I was under the uh, teaching that um, fish were cold-blooded and therefore they can't feel. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be true at all. <laughs> they don't look as though they can't feel. When you take them out of the water, they look greatly distressed. And dying, I associate not with having a good time, not in the dying anyway. Hmm. Do you see, um, with our experience in the world, we start to think, hang on, this isn't consistent. In some sense, the spirit of truth starts to come, doesn't it? And my great um, leap in my teen early teenage years was suddenly shifting to realizing I could learn at school, that one could revise and do well in tests. And then, therefore, learning what understanding is about, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a small step, isn't it, from being able to pass a test to actually seeing how 
the truth of what we've been tested on is consistent. And if it isn't consistent, my goodness, you start to transcend even the lesson so that you're finding a greater lesson. You've received the spirit of truth without realizing it, haven't you? And so, of course, my mind then shifts to science is fascinating. It's seeking truth. You know, what's out there and so on. What's the truth of the matter? Um, the weather isn't just a random chance. It, you know, there's some causality that could be revealed. Let's find out what it is. And that what starts to picture is that the causality is always consistent. And when it's not, that's a fascination what's going on here. You start to have a, a yearning to understand logic. What is consistency? What do we mean by it? Oh, that sounds a bit formal put like that, but I became, quite simply, a master of logic. So that I could um, strive with study with professor of um, philosophy and who was an expert on logic and not had the technical understanding entirely that he had but had the logical ability that he had so that one could relate to him well in that context of learning formal logic. And it's not the formal logic that has rescued me in life, but the reasoning ability in more everyday sense of the importance of reasoning and consistency. Hang on a sec. It's said by the Theosophists, which is a, a group of um, people that, uh, that, well, at least feel that they um, are understanding, well, they, originally it was understanding God and philosophy, um, if you like, the philosophy of God, which we would have earlier called theology, but they brought more reasoning and philosophy into it. Um, yes, it was said by Theosophists that um, uh, there's no religion like truth. And, well, <laughs> it's to point out, isn't it, it's a saying that they have which tends to be in there. Um, uh, places of worship. Well, they don't really worship. I uh, don't know what they do, really. Uh, <laughs> they chat and they talk about different religions and uh, talk about ancient wisdom and so on. Um, but in some senses, the truth we should be valuing, not some um, mistranslated, potted version of it although all the mistranslated, potted versions of it, the religions of the world, do in some sense contain something of the ancient wisdom. Um, hmm. But ideally, transcending with such view, what we really need is truth. And, and in the Christian faith we have the notion, don't we, that God is truth. He's also love, etc. and so forth. But the truth is absolutely, you know, it's very hard to <laughs> say you know God if you don't have the truth. Now the world looks at what the Christian religion's made of the truth and thinks, well, you have anything but the truth. You've got a bunch of fairy stories and you're getting nowhere. And um, in some sense they're right. Um, but the world doesn't have a better solution um, to get rid of any or all of these religions 
um, far from leaving the world better off, seems to leave it in a desperate poverty of understanding. But what we need in some basic sense is the truth, but not just the truth about um, what the relationships of things are in the universe of uncertainty, but something about the truth of spiritual matters, by which we mean the things unmeasurable and quantifiable and weighable and, um, you know, the things unseen, like concepts, thought, emotions, um, beliefs, trust, faith, hope. We need some understanding of these things because what we really value, our personhood, seems to be in this realm, not simply in the realm of uh, eating, working and sleeping, but in the thought realm, in the understanding realm, in the truth realm. And uh, that's where our focus needs to be, to be happy. When we don't somehow get that side of ourselves right, well, the world becomes a combination of wretched, frightening, unhappy, full of what the Buddhist calls dukkha, which is discontent and things not fitting and things not being fulfilling and uh, the, what they see as the hungry ghost sort of um, uh, state that one could conceivably degenerate into where no matter what you eat you're still thin and hunger and uh, there's, you know, <laughs> poor soul, desperate depression we I've seen it on some of my friends. I don't mean in some obviously supernatural way, but in some sense that real depression where they stop eating and all, all hope seems to drain from them. I've got one friend, in spite of being intensely religious, in fact, I would say intense religion so often results in what we would in Pentecostal terms call a spirit of religion, which is anything but life eternal. It destroys even the transitory life here in the universe of uncertainty. And they get thin, they stop eating, they, they sit motionless for almost hours staring into space and just think, God, Heavenly Father, how do I rescue my friend? And you know, you can't even speak Jesus into them because they know it all. They've got this incredible shell that keeps the view of the loving, true, life-giving, warm Jesus out. They've got a horrific condemnation, legalistic, fundamentalist, uh, horrific Old Testament view of God, a Torah version that you would think, but can't you see that that, that view of God resulted in, in the 2,000 year record of the Jewish people, their persecution and horrific experiences. Don't you think that it wasn't just not keeping to it, but that perhaps the very view itself of God was a misunderstanding? But they can't, you see, because in desperation they turn to their interpretation and their acceptance of the Torah as their salvation. Even the messianics, messianic Christians, the ones that are, feel they're Christian but follow the Jewish peace, 
they end up studying almost exclusively the Torah. And they interpret the story of Jesus in terms of their understanding of the Torah instead of, well, I don't think it would be very valuable, but instead of interpreting the Torah with the understanding of Jesus. That's different, you see. It's not worshipping the same thing. Hmm, didn't expect that to come. Thank you, Dad. Let me illustrate the uh, initial drive of this recording in, in a um, picture type, par parallel sort of way. You can have a huge library, can't you? Well, apart from the fact there's no way you could read all the books in it. I mean, you need to prioritize. Well, you, you've probably prioritized on, for instance, your philosophy or your religion. Um, and then certain exponents in particular in it um, might be certain books, you know, scriptures might be certain persons that you follow. I mean, you might in, in uh, you know, in the 21st century, you might be a, a Jordan Peterson fan, you know, you follow um, everything that he says. And uh, you start to interpret the world from that perspective, uh, because you find this more um, effective, more successful, more to your liking, more to your, um, it makes sense to you, it, it's, uh, it's helping, it's a blessing. And if I can extend that, uh, I say to you that, supposing, you know, you can't take this vast library with you, uh, you're going to be um, traveling light. You know, you're going to be a, a nomad around the world. Which two or three books do you think you should take? Well, of course, the religious person says, uh, well, the uh, book of our scripture for a start, you know, it might be um, a Bible if you're Christian. It might be um, the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, if you're Hindu. Um, but whatever you see. And I'm saying, no, no, um, you can be even more specific when it comes to such a choice. You will find it's a vast library you've chosen, although you've only got, you know, two or three books. Even one of them is vast in its implications. And you can be an even better economist <laughs> as regards... Um, using your time most fruitfully by uh, fortuitously perhaps or being led towards something that's even more central within perhaps those um, uh, books that you've chosen. So in the case of, uh, well, obviously in the case of um, the Bible, I would say John's Gospel. Um, you know, even the Gospels were a bit wide. And even in John's Gospel, I might say, hmm, John 17. <laughs> and even in John 17, I might say, hmm, Father, that seems to take priority. The Word, His name, seems to be possibly foundational, the cornerstone. Now, religious Christian faith has taken the cornerstone to be Jesus. But of course the interpretation of that is this, uh, as I say, blonde-haired, blue-eyed man wandering around Galilee preaching and healing. And uh, if you're still in the world, well, that's a good start because you might then want to try and delve into and find out what he was about. But um, 
to stay with the story without the understanding, without the Gnostic uh, teaching, if you like, of the Holy Spirit, oh my goodness, uh, <laughs> it's not going to be terribly useful any more than uh, Jack and Jill. Um, you know, fairy stories in general. I don't mean that Jack and Jill fairy stories are fundamentally in our society and a great blessing. Um, and they may actually have even more fundamentally in them what the foundation of, of life may be, God himself. But um, where well, you need to find what that fundamental truth is. And that can be helped by finding something that highly likely seems to be recommended as the absolute essence of things. Now, in some Christian circles, the more um, formal um, uh, ritualistic um, aspects of Christianity, you might see it as, oh, it's the Ten Commandments. In fact, Ten Commandments are very Old Testament, not uh, not really dealt with in, um, well, the understanding of the Old the Ten Commandments could be very much commandment, not principles, and not really from the point of view of um, Holy Spirit understanding of Jesus. Okay, so what is uh, perhaps fundamental in, in, as I see it, John 17, in, in the Gospels, is the name of God, which is Father. You know, as I've said uh, too many times now, over 200 times the name Father is used for God by Jesus, so to speak, in, 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 the, in the Gospel story. And... Um, it's not using any other name. Jesus is specifically using the name Father. So it seems to be fundamental that focus on this and you go a long way. So I would say one doesn't spend most of one's time on Revelation or the Torah or um, Paul's writings or actually even all four Gospels. I would spend most of my time on something very narrow, like John 17, um, and having, as dare I say, and I don't think I should say mastering it, but having had what now seems considerable insight into that, then you can benefit from reading a bit more widely some other bits of John's Gospel, not all of it. And remember, we're not worshipping God, we're not worshipping, I'm not even worshipping the name of God as Father. I have in the back of my mind, he's talking in parallels. This is a blessing, not something to be worshipped in itself. I am in some sense, needing to worship the unseen God, the unmanifest, the fullness and truth of the reality, not the story, not the golden-haired, blue-eyed man, but a truth that's foundational to life. What I truly value is life, you see. Not even truth. It's life. And that's why we have this struggle between, well, is he a God of truth or a God of love? Well, he's both, and which is more important? Well, they're both equally important, and so forth and so forth. Well, mm, but in some sense, the priority of John 17 is life eternal. What's that mean? I've got a feeling it's what I should be valuing. <laughs> it's not the full knowledge of God. Even that is not quite right. It's the necessary knowledge of God. 
for me in my predicament of being a child, of being not conscious enough of the fullness of the truth, of the true reality, as the Buddhist would say, although he ends up with, well, he doesn't end up with no God, actually. I think the ordinary Buddhist still seems to worship the gods. <laughs> They certainly worship the Buddha anyway. Well, I, I say certainly, but you know what I mean? It seems to, to my point of view, they look as though they're worshipping Buddha and his teachings. Hmm, as they say it. Hmm, yes, okay. It doesn't mean to say they don't have a lot of the truth, but... Well, it's... Well, it's a different culture. It's not quite my home ground. Hmm. So, let's think a moment. In some sense, I'm saying be narrower and more economic. Go to the heart of the matter. It might be the story of Jesus. It might be specifically John 17. It might be even narrower still in that this fatherhood thing seems to be an amazing foundation uh, principle. Whether it's literally enough and true, I don't know. But I've got a feeling I'm safer anchoring things to this than anything else. But I am mindful of the fact it's still only a means to an end. I'm really seeking something of the, what I might call a personification of, what I have present value. And I want that to move, I value that moving in the direction of something better which is always ever beyond. You know, my God is in that sense infinite, beyond me always. But not so beyond it's not a blessing to me. Of course, I'm a child of God in, in that notion, you see. But there, there's certain parts of God that I need to focus on. In, in this case, in the Christian case, is loving kindness. This is a particular safeguard to me in this my state of ignorance at the minute I'm always in a state of some ignorance until I have the fullness of the understanding of God until I have the fullness of knowing God I will always be in some measure of ignorance And it may be, let me really risk something out on a limb here, that God himself is the same. He is always less than what he's becoming. And is humble in that sense. Else he could not explore and expand into that continual, infinite expansion of life that he is. Now, I could be completely wrong here because I'm thinking in terms of, I not about space, but certainly time. And at other times I'm thinking of God as outside of time and the creator of time. But you see, in all these cases, I'm still thinking of God in terms of a manifest or a manifestable God. Whereas God is... I won't say understood by it, but in some sense that he's the unmanifest. 
partially manifested in our consciousness. But we're children. Now, and I may be going astray here by the very foundation that I'm on that we're a child of God. But if we are a child of God in some meaning sense, meaningful sense, even in terms of the truth of God, the reality of whatever his true being is, then we too are of that. I was going to say material, and I don't mean material, do I? But you know what I mean? Do you see I'm trying to... It's out of reach, isn't it? I can keep getting nearer, but... To be convinced I understand is... Would be death itself. I suspect. The loveliness of people is that they're a mystery. You know, the loveliness of the wife. It's not just that she's gorgeous to hold and is all kind and loving. It's that she's unpredictable. <laughs> you never really know. <laughs> and she feels she doesn't understand men either. I know she feels she does, of course, doesn't she? She's completely deluded. <laughs> we at least know that we don't understand her. <laughs> I think I'll end on that note. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs>